Well, first of all, I mean, we could say thanks to both you guys for, you know, agreeing to, to jump on with us. Obviously, both huge influences in, in both of our careers. And, you know, it's also huge for both of us that we became, you know, friends with both you guys. And, you know, speaking from, um, you know, on a personal note, this is a match that I that I had studied when I was coming up and I was very young in the business and, and one that I watched um, strictly, you know, I mean, it was a perfect storytelling match and, and psychology and everything about it. And I just remember rewatching it and rewatching it and rewatching it, just taking different pieces away every time that I watched it. So it's exciting for us to, to be able to talk to both you guys about it. And just, um, you know, it, at the time, I'm not sure if it was meant to, to be that way, but it, it was a match that really changed the direction of the whole industry. And, um, you know, again, thanks for, thanks for taking the time to do this with those guys. Absolutely. It's fun for me anyway. I'm happy to do it. Well, you know, let's get into it because I, I know you guys don't got a lot of time. Um, so in, in looking at this match, you know, the end result of this thing, everything changes. Everything in the industry from this point forward, I, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, this match changes everything. It changes the direction of the WWE. It changes the direction of both of your characters. When was it that you guys knew that this was going to happen coming out of this match or that you wanted it to happen coming out of this match? Did it just happen organically throughout the months and the buildup up to it? Or did you, I mean, was there, was there a plan to do this, I guess? I don't think Steve knew anything about what they had in mind for me till the last minute, till that day. Steve was the first guy to come up to me and say, uh, Vince talked to him about me turning heel. Nobody up to that point, including everyone else in the dressing room, knew anything about it as far as I knew. So it was really, uh, we only had, uh, like, as I remember all of this, back at this time, we just worked the Survivor Series and we had a great match at Survivor mm-hmm. Series. Yep. But we didn't expect to work again for, for a while. We were going to sort of come back a longer break, like maybe SummerSlam or something like that. We 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 knew we were going to work together again, but it was kind of like we had done our thing and we were going to wet some time come between us. But as things came out with Sean, with the belt, where we forfeited the belt and all that, and uh, suddenly uh, we were both sort of sort of stuck with each other again. I remember it was like, I remember thought WrestleMania with Steve was kind of, um, we were going in kind of cold in the sense that we'd already worked and kind of had done all our stuff, best stuff that we could think of to do in the fiber series. And I felt like, um, it was not where I'd expect to be working with Sean that, that WrestleMania and then he'd forfeited. So I was kind of, um, a little bit in limbo as far as where I was going. And Steve seemed like, uh, just sort of a substitute, even though Steve was hot. We, then the rumble thing that led into us, we, we, uh, at least for me, I just kept sort of following the storyline and Steve was just following his own storyline. We just kept sort of overlapping each other in a good way. You know, I really, uh, loved working with Steve at Survivor Series and I loved, uh, you know, the chemistry we had and I wanted to do something really special with Steve. And I didn't, I didn't think it was, it was going to happen at WrestleMania. I thought WrestleMania was kind of putting us together a little too soon again, but, uh, in saying all that, once we got there that day and I sort of, my whole character was going to change. I, um, and Steve talked to me and kind of was not sure how his character was going to go, whether he was going to become a baby face or that's kind of where they were taking him, but he wanted to take his time getting there. As far as I remember, it was like, so we didn't want to completely over like turn him Steve into a sort of a good guy right out of one match kind of thing. So it's like, he's going to stay the same style and I'm going to say that stay more an aggressive heel style or baby face heel style. And what I love about the match, you know, right from the start is just the entrances of, uh, and when you watch uh, how Steve and I both go in the ring, yeah. Um, yeah. he was the heel. He was the bad guy. I was, I walk out, I'm kind of cheered and I'm kind of the cool baby face and I'm coming in for revenge. And, and it's funny how, we were completely switched over by the end of it. And we never Mm -hmm. changed our styles. We never did anything other than wrestle the same way we did all the time. And, uh, it was just an amazing, I think a bit of psychology and the two two wrestlers being able to read each other's characters, you know, and going back to the, uh, going back to the survivor series thing, you know, when you, you pretty much handpicked me, Brett, you know, cause you were making a comeback from having your knee cleaned up. And, you know, that was a big honor for me because we had worked at a couple of house shows, 
you know, I started off working with Sean, and I believe we were down there in Houston, Texas, and I just worked with Sean. And, and you said to me in the dressing room, he goes, you said, hey, man, that was, a, that was a great match. He goes, you said, I'll work with you anytime. And that was a big compliment to me because I was a huge Bret Hart fan before I'd come to the Federation. And, you know, Brett got into business a little bit earlier than me, obviously got started way earlier over in Calgary. So I'd seen his entire body of work. And Brett, you know, is such such a high-level guy with such multiple layers of psychology and all the, you know, the technical aspects and mechanical aspects that he brings. And he brought a reality-based, you know, product to the ring. Yeah, you know, we've always known that the business is a work, but Brett was total reality to me, and that's why I had so much respect for his work. And then finally, you know, when I came into WWF, I shed the ringmaster gimmick. I came up with the Stone Cold Steve Austin thing. I went through, you know, all the old trials and tribulations, and I had these moments where, you know, give me some color commentary, you know, opp- opportunities, working with uh, Aldo Montoya, cutting promos with him. And what I was doing, you know, I came in there as a heel, and I just started talking so much trash, so much shit, that people started gravitating towards that character. I'll never forget one house show, Brian Pillman comes in. You know, of course, me and Brian were good friends from WCW's on Hollywood Blonde days, and we'd kind of separated. He'd gone through the things that he'd gone through, and I'd gone my direction. We were singles now. And uh, I remember coming uh, back from the ring one time, and Brian had watched the match, and I got a louder pop than my babyface opponent. Mm-hmm. And Brian said to me, God damn it, kid, you're a babyface. <laughs> and I said, F you. Because, dude, you know, you take this stuff serious when you're trying to be a heel or baby and someone, yeah. and I'm trying to be a heel and he's calling me a baby, that's damn near an insult. Yeah. And I said, F you, dude. I said, I'm a heel. And so all of these things started happening. And, you know, we had the Royal Rumble in San Antonio. I get tossed out. I come back in behind the referee's back. You know, I end up tossing all those guys or, or bread over. And then we do the, the final four way. When I went into that match, I truly did have, I was sick as a dog, got a blown out wheel. And then, you know, we kept going, and I kept being a thorn in Brett's side, and I kept attacking him backstage. And we, you know, like I said, I was probably the substitute, and, and, you know, maybe we were going to go our own separate ways. And I'll never forget before WrestleMania 13 happened, it was two weeks before the match, I believe, because I've always told this story. And I'm in, I'm in San Antonio watching Monday Night Raw, and all of a sudden I see it announced that it's going to be Brett the Hitman Hart versus Stone Cold Steve Austin in a submission match. And I was livid because I am not a submission style wrestler. Yeah. I, you know, got dropped on my head. I turned into a brawler. I was starting to become hot, somewhat hot as a baby, but prided myself in being a heel. All of a sudden, you know, I'm going into this match with Brett the Hitman Hart, which I love that. But the submission part you know, totally threw me. And I remember I voiced my concerns to, to Vince McMahon because I truly felt that they were putting me in a compromising position because I'm not a submission wrestler. Everybody knows I only had about three or four moves, and the rest were raking the eyes, ball shots, and stuff like that. So this is not going to be a, a match that's catered for me. And as we rolled into Chicago, before we went to the finish room, I just knew, and, and Chicago was becoming somewhat of a stronghold for me. For some reason, those fans really kind of gravitated towards that character mm-hmm. and myself. And I just figured we're going into this thing. I believe we were the third to the last match. We were in a real good position. There was a buffer match between us and the main event, which was Sid versus Taker. Mm-hmm. And, man, I really thought, and I believe Brett shared these same sentiments with me, but I mean, he probably thought the glass was half full being the worker in person that he is. But I thought we were going to stink the joint out. I truly did. And we did everything but that. We ripped it apart with the five-star performance and started uh, the execution of what, you know, we would need some work on the back end for Brett to turn heel and for me to turn babyface. But like he said, maintaining the both, both styles of work with which we had. Steve, let me ask, let me ask you a question. Like when you, you were saying that you were kind of, you know, pissed off that you, that there's going to be a submission match and you didn't have any submission moves and things like that. Was it, um, did you know at the time that, that, Vince was wanting to go in the direction, or did either of you guys know that that he was wanting to maybe kind of do a switch there with with you turning more babyface and Brett eventually turning you know turning heel and kind of starting the ball rolling on that? And was it almost him kind of foreshadowing there, like like putting you in a match that people know that your character is is at a disadvantage? You know what I mean? Like is that kind of like the the, the kind of foreshadowing of that type of thing? Like you're already at a disadvantage I, I going know, into it. I don't know what. 
I didn't know what Vince wanted out of me as far as after that match and, and what direction I would really be going in. And Brett being the veteran, having much more of a rela- relationship with Vince and having been there for as long as he had, probably knew way more than I did. I didn't really, you know, understand the magnitude of everything that was that was about to happen and that I was going to transition into, you know, one of the hottest baby faces in the history of the business. Mm-hmm. And this was going to be, you know, I, I can say right now, you know, without Bret Hart, you know, in my career, I don't think I have the career that I ended up having where you, whether you start with Survivor Series or talk about this match and just our feud in its totality, you know, I would have never been the same or I probably would have never, ever reached the heights that I did had it not been for Bret Hart. But I did not know, you know, coming out of this match, things would go like they did for him and for me. I think too that like you know you said that you were you were that you thought this match was you were going to stink the joint out and I think something can be said for it too I think that the best performers and I've said this a lot in the past always produce under an immense amount of pressure and it's almost like when you go out there with that fear you produce something special is that kind of what happened here like you just had that a chip on your shoulder that that you went out there with that oh my this could be really bad but it just it ended up being a classic well, man, no, I, I didn't have any fear in me whatsoever because I was riding pretty much uh, a professional high because mechanically I was very good in the ring. I was very aggressive. Uh, my character was in, in a very good position. They were putting me in good positions. Mm-hmm. And I knew with Brett, with, working with Brett, you know, I, I figured we, technically, yeah, we could stink the joint out. But if you'll remember this, Brett, we went to the finish room. And as I remember this, it's Brett myself and Vince McMahon. I don't remember anybody else being in that room and we're going over the match and we're not going over the match. We're going over a finish because this is the way it was back in 96, 97, whenever this match was, he says, I want you guys to go out there. And at the end of the match, you know, Brett's going to have you in a sharpshooter and you're going to pass out. And at this time, there was a no color policy in the, in the Federation. Nobody bleeds. Nobody does nothing. So, you know, he gives us our marching orders. You know, Brett might have asked a question or two, but, I mean, we went out, and we kind of just walked out to the arena. Nobody's out there. The doors aren't open. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I, I just, I'm really second-guessing this finish. I was always willing to put Brett over, but I was second-guessing me passing out in the sharpshooter. So I circled back around to Vince. I knocked on his door, and he let me in. And I said, Vince, I said, are you sure about this finish? I said, man, I, I don't know. I said, are you sure about this finish? And he goes, oh, this is a straight up quote from Vince. He goes, oh, God damn, Steve. I promise you it'll work. And I said, okay. And I trusted him. And that's when I went back out to Brett. And we started pacing around the ring, just kind of, you know, just kind of just chatting. And Brett said to me, and he goes, Steve, he goes, if you're going to pass out in the sharpshooter, you need to have color. Mm-hmm. And I said, man, do you think? He goes, oh, yeah, I know. Well, here's the thing. There's a no-collar policy. I've been in the company probably about a year. I don't have any stroke. I don't have any pull. And so Brett, being the veteran that he is, he says, if you want, I'll do it. And I said, because that's meaning he's taken me under his umbrella policy of seniority and his legend uh, that that was ongoing in the WWF at the time. So I said, okay, man. Cool. So people have always asked me, hey, man, you never did any blade jobs in the past. People said, you know, Bret Hart cut you. Were you afraid? No, I wasn't afraid. I've done many blade jobs before. But when the man, Vince McMahon, says no color, man, I'm going by those orders. Yeah. And Bret was covered my ass. We needed that drama at the end of the match. And I have another story as we get, get into the match. But I'll never forget Bret making that call. And when you look, and I've watched this match twice because I knew we were going to do this show, that imagery and how Brett brought the offense to me, that grinding style that he always had, his intensity and his focus, especially when he's working my leg, Mm -hmm. you know, that color, that iconic visual of me. And I timed that sharpshooter. It was between a minute and a half and two minutes. And uh, from when he put it on, when he turned me over to when I just passed out. And that was absolute magic. And obviously his, his... altercation when he went back to work in my leg and then Ken belly to be- belly to back him. And then the way Brett cowers down from him or just turns away from him, his step through of that rope, his paws on the apron, 
the timing, the deliberation, the way he did everything that he did was just absolutely magic. And you, mm. you can go through this match and you can pick up so many subtleties that mm. a, a rookie or someone without a trained eye would just gloss yeah. over and miss. Mm. But it was absolute magic at night. And I didn't mean to get ahead of myself, but I'm going back to the fact that Brett suggested, you know, Steve, you need color. And he was right. Well, that that's a great point, and I, I took notes on this thing because I went back, I rewatched, I, I you know, I peeled it apart years ago, but I f- peeling it apart now and seeing it again, it, it's still just like you said, the subtleties in this thing. And, and so, Brett, you, you talked about how, let's say, in a perfect world, you and Steve work for the first time at WrestleMania, or it's the last time, it's your blow off. It, it's not that. So, and it's a submission match to Steve's point. If you listen to the commentary, Vince covers it. He says, you know, uh, Vin, or Steve can beat, you know, Brett into submission until he gives up. So that at least covered that because I get that aspect of, Correct. well, they're not going to think I have a chance because this is Brett's specialty and you want there to be some question as to what the finish is going to be. Mm-hmm. But you guys come out, the, the glass breaks literally for the first time. Brett, you come out, you walk over that glass. I mean, you guys are fired up. Steve, you're like a damn bobblehead up on the ropes there. Brett, you, you're you power walking down there. You could feel that you guys, whether it was exactly where you wanted it or when you wanted it, that something special was going to happen, at least me as a fan and still a fan watching this. The intensity at the beginning, did Brett, did you feel like that was the tone you know, set right from the double leg at the beginning? Well, you know, I think... You know, I just want to say, like, right off the bat, that um, like before Steve ever came in, I was always going to Vince's office and always going to. Why don't we have Steve Austin? Like he, he was going to stunning Steve, I think. And uh, but even when he was in uh, WCW, and then he went to, uh, I remember going into Vince's office and going, "Why he's in ECW now? Like, my God, why is this guy not? Why don't we pick this guy up? Because they were looking for guys all the time." And I remember it was about a week or two later, Steve was in the dressing room. And he started for us and, uh, or for WWE at that time. But I always had respect for Steve and we had a natural, we seemed to, you know, gravitate to each other working wise. Like we always, always worked well. I don't remember ever having a, you know, we always had just great uh, energy in the ring and great, his character sort of against my character always worked really well right from the get go. And he, I remember him working, uh, those spot shows and, in Texas, and I remember going to him, talking to him about how I had always wanted to work with him, and I, just, I think I did have a lot to do with him getting finally getting booked and finally taking a look at him and closer look at Steve. But going into uh, that that match, you know, I think the Rumble set it up really well, and all the Steve had cost me the title against uh, Sid when I won that final four. So, you know, there was so much stuff that we had that was always sort of just on the back burner. We weren't always the sort of the primary uh, focus of the shows at that time, but we, we just sort of did really worked well with the bits that they gave us and going into to WrestleMania. I mean, I, I, again, I, I knew from my own experience with um, Bob Backlund and those, I had an I quit match with him. And I think it was WrestleMania 11, which was maybe my worst pay-per-view I ever had. And no offense to Bob because it wasn't Bob's fault either, but Submission matches are are a death sentence. They are really you take out half the fun of false finishes with the yeah. pinfalls. I mean that's that's way more spots you can do. It cuts your your match in half as far as what you can do. But knowing that and knowing those two characters, I guess Vince, I, we got to give Vince the credit. I think for the 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 vision of the match of of a submission match because I was like Steve. I thought it was a I thought it was a you know really going to be a a bad, bad match for us to showcase our talents. So when we, sh- you know, if anything, it should just been a rematch period, but a submission match limited us, or at least I thought, and I felt the same way as Steve. But I also knew going in there that um, when Vince had started to turn me, he wanted to turn me, me heel. And I could tell we even going into that for the last few months, that was the, when the fans started to kind of take to the heels a lot more for you know, the ECW or what, but, I remember the heels were starting to get over and they were starting to cheer Steve a lot because he was really uh, a cool heel to sort of take, take a liking to. And the baby faces, and I, and I, and I was uh, at the top of the heap, but I'd been sort of on top for a while and they were kind of getting tired of that milky white baby face. And uh, mm-hmm. so there was a change coming and we could all smell it in the air and I could sense 
that Steve was the guy, you know, he was going to, he was going to get over so strong. Cause whenever you get over so strong as a heel, you're naturally sooner or later, you're going to turn baby face. Yeah. Right. That's where the, that's where the money is. That's where, that's the, the genius of, of being a great heel. And the payoff comes when you turn baby face much the way Steve did. And, uh, I could see all that long before it ever happened. And I knew going into that match that we needed to, have a real ass case. I remember the psychology me and Steve talked about when we walked to the ring was uh, this thing, like if I was in a real, this reminds me of a school fight. That's what I always remember mm-hmm. talking about. So this is like a school fight with two, like, you know, the sort of the, the guy that's the quarterback on the football team that's been a good guy for, you know, everyone in high school knows he's the dude kind of thing. And Steve's like this badass that just came from another school. And there's going to be, you can see this kind of showdown coming for a long time. And it's like, they're yeah. going to fight after school. And this is the, this was that match, and uh, right from the leg tackle at the beginning of the match, you know, it looked it had a sense of realism to it that I always loved. I really admired the way we worked. You know, it was one of the easiest matches I ever had in my life. It was there was absolutely just it was just great work, everything, and even even the uh, I always thought if you tell people I said this is the greatest match I ever had in the sense that no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. <laughs> like, <it was> really, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> best spot I remember being in this the only potato I gave myself was that that when Steve threw me into the hockey boards yes oh my god yeah. that hurt what? like hell I remember lying there on the cement going why did I do that I ran into it as hard <laughs> as I could just like a turnbuckle well and I got a it question hurt on like that. hell I got a question on that too because I mean that to your point, Brett, that's the art of it, is, is to not harm any animals in the making of this film, right? <laughs> but, Steve, you took a backdrop down the stairs. Yeah. What the hell? Like, how, <laughs> that had to have hurt, right? Dude, that gets them every single time, you know, because yeah, I think I was, I was probably on offense there for just a second. You know, we were 50-50 throughout the match, and if you watch this match, one thing I love about it, because Brett is bringing it. He's probably bringing a little bit more offense uh, on a percentage level than I am. He really took the match to me, and then I make a couple of uh, you know babyface comebacks on him. Mm-hmm. But Brett really brought the action. And the brawling was kind of 50-50, but I would probably take it over at that point. You'll watch certain points in this match. You know, you got to turn it back around. So going for the old going for the old pile driver, whether you're on the ground, on the cement, or on the stairs – you know, that's a great spot to turn it around. And actually, because the, the stairs are sloped, it's an easier bump than, than it what actually looks like. It looks very painful. It's pretty effective and pretty easy. Uh, and going back to Brett's point, the, the match was so easy because you, 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 you'll see a call here or there, but heads are down. You'll never see any mouths move. Mm-hmm. And going back to like, uh, you know, when we came back over the guardrail or, or maybe this was after the clothesline from the apron to Brett on the floor, mm-hmm. and I see the staircase laying there. Well, when Brett and I had kind of talked about this match, there were maybe five to seven things that we knew were going to happen. The rest was all called on the fly in the ring, and that's a shoot. And so I see these stairs, and I said, oh, man, Brett's laying there. He's selling for me. And then, so I just, as I'm getting up, I say, kick me. And he kind of goes, huh? And I just said, kick me. Because I was going to pick up the stairs and I was, I was coming at him, had the stairs over my head. So if he doesn't kick me, I've really got to hit him with these stairs. And of course, Brett, you know, kicks me in the gut. I go ass over tea kettle backwards. He takes back over on me. It was just little things like that and feeling that crowd and just really listening to the crowd. And we just, uh, like I said, you can watch that match and you won't see a lot of communication because it was really just going from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. And there's no tells, there's no foreshadowing in this match. You don't say, you know, oh, you can tell this is going to happen because the match was completely, like I said, we had bullet points. And one of the cool things about this match, where I'll let you guys go back to asking questions, was even getting towards the end of the match, we, okay, we knew that we wanted to uh, use the bell on the finish. We just came out of that out of the blue. You know, I was going to wrap the extension cord around, and when I did that in very dramatic fashion, three wraps so everybody gets it. Hey, he's got a friggin' extension cord. He's fixing to choke Brett. Yeah. But it's the introduction to, uh, of the bell. You know, Brett sits, got me in a compromised position. He brings the bell, puts it on the apron, changes his mind. Hey, a steel chair would be better. Mm-hmm. So we've introduced an object there that we're going to use for the finish. 
It's there, ready at hand. He goes back and gets the steel chair. He's going to do the pillman, put your you know leg in a chair, put your yep. leg in a chair and jump off the turnbuckle. I beat him to the punch, clocked him with the uh, chair. But it's just little things like that, and we knew that was going to happen. But it was just it was such an easy match to work. And with all the flip flopping and flying that's going on right now, this match, uh, although it was done, this WrestleMania 13 will go into WrestleMania 34. All these years later, this match still holds up, whether it was back then, right now, or in the future, because of the physicality, because of the intensity. Yep. There's nothing crazy that goes on in this match, but it's so real, it will well, hold up to the test of time. It goes It goes back to, to what, I mean, I say this a lot, right? I mean, and I, I think that sometimes they get away from the, the essence of, of a lot of times what a match is and that's selling. Like you, it, sometimes that's kind of becoming a lost art form. And that, and I think that was apparent in this match when it's done right, it, you don't need the huge moves and all those other sorts of things to, to kind of fill in for that. Like, I mean, when you were talking about lifting up the stairs and him kicking you just the way that you felt, looked like you almost broke your ankle, you yeah. know, and just that, that subtlety on that cell. And then when you get up in the ring and you know, how you were saying how aggressive Brett was on his offense, and then he climbs up to do his the, the form we've seen him do a million times when the guy's in a prone position, but you weren't in that position. You were trying to pull yourself up off the mat, and he's like attacking this wounded animal that's fighting for his life. Like you're 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 trying to get up, and he hits you with that form as you're getting up, and just little things like that to me mean more than just throwing out like a big move just for the sake of doing it. You know what I mean? And then later on, when 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 you had the um, when you said you got up and you and he, he had the your foot in the chair and you stopped him. And when you got up, you didn't just start hitting him with a chair. You hobbled around the ring, and then you know that you didn't oversell it for the rest of the match. But that affected you the rest of the match. You could see you had that limp, that hitch in, in your giddy up the the rest of the match. It was there, and that was that that told the story for the rest of the match. It did, and, and it was just it was it was gritty, and the, the way he was attacking me, and, and uh, you know the one spot, and, you know doing the sit down thing on my legs, dropping the uh, the arms on and inside my uh, knee, and finally he's going to drag me back to the ring ropes again, and I just said I'll move, and and yep. when I'm when mm. when I moved, he came down, hit his ass on the on the mat, you know that's when I hit him with a stunner out of the blues, mm. and to get back to cell mode. But and if you'll notice, then he sells the stunner. I can't win by pinfall, yep. as Jerry Lawler, uh, uh, you know, covers in the color commentary. Yep. And you know, I got, I've got to add, the commentary in this match was spectacular. Spot on. A lot it's of people think on. Vince McMahon is over the top. Bullshit. He brings so much enthusiasm, passion, and he's the master storyteller. He's the owner. He's the booker. He's the vision. He knows everything that he didn't know about the color. But he knows the story better than anybody because he's had the vision and he knows where we're going. Jim Ross was absolutely on fire, and Jerry Lawler was on fire. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after that stunner, you know, I I blind feed back to Brett, who, you know, I, I want to go back in the cell mode. Brett kicks my leg back under back from under me, and there we go back in the action. It was it was just tit for tat, and nothing spectacular. It, it was just a working man's match with. No crazy bumps involved. But the, the the thing about what I loved about this match is it felt real. It felt like a fight. It looked legit. And I'm not saying all matches today, but a lot of matches today look rehearsed, look choreographed. This did not look like that. This looked like two guys that were trying to beat each other. Even ju- the, the swinging neck breaker, Brett, that you hit on Steve – the struggle that you two had until you hit it, just it, it, the, those little subtleties that, that put it over the top. I mean, the crispness was there. It looked amazing once you guys got there. But to get there, there was a fight. And and I wish everyone would go back and even just watch that little bit. Watch the whole thing, but just watch what I'm talking about on that neck breaker. And, you know, you know I, just, I think that... Um the best wrestling always tries to pretend to be real. Like, mm. You know, it's got to be, a, you know, you want to be real. And I think, mm. I think if there's anything that really shines in this match, it's the fact that we both had realistic style. Steve was a real kind of character. So there's lots of badass kind of guys like Steve in the world. And he, when his character was, was forming, it was like such a cool character. I remember I liked, 
to him as a heel character. I think, you know, just as much as the fans did, it was just a, he was a great character to interact with, like to mix everything up with. And, uh, you know, I love the match for its realism. I think I always tell people, so when you watch UFC, like a really, really good UFC fight, you know, at the end, you, you kind of breaks your heart that, you know, that they hurt each other as bad as they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this match, it's like, okay, you know, everyone knows it's a work. But this match delivers everything that the greatest UFC fight can deliver. It, and if anything, more. Like, they don't use chairs. They don't use bells. They don't use... So this is an intense, uh, very physical kind of, um, um, you know, build up to this match. It's just the wrestling, uh, the realism of it. I think you always, I always tell people it's, it's the most real kind of match that I put on for people... And yet, when I say all that, it was one of the easiest matches of my career. It was so easy. And I do, it does make me kind of laugh sometimes when I watch a lot of it back. Cause I remember I had told Steve, like we had talked about uh, getting the, the, the color in the match. And I said, I'll, I, as I remember, I remember I asked Steve about doing it. And he said he, he'd done it a few times or he'd done it once or something like that. And I remember I said, you don't want to take any chances at WrestleMania. Trust me, let me do it. And I remember he, he trusted me, which is, a you know, this, I learned the first thing I learned in the business to never let anybody do that to you. And Steve totally trusted me. I said, I, I just trust me because I'll do it right. And I remember I had, there was a lot of, could be a lot of heat. I mean, I could have been just as much trouble as Steve <laughs> at that time. I was, they had had uh, no blood policy for a while and the, 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 the toy companies and everybody were on Vince's ass and like no blood. And I go, well, they, let's just pretend it was an accident. What are they going to do? <laughs> and, um, you know, we, so I, remember I kind of had Steve talked into it and I said, but if you change your mind, cause it was a pretty serious decision to, to go in there and make that call. And for me to make that call for Steve or vice versa, you know, it was like, I said, if you change your mind, we'll abort. We'll, we'll, you know, if you really feel uncomfortable about it, we won't do it. I said, but if you give me the green light, we're doing it and there'd be no turning back. And so we were in the ring and I think it's somewhere in there just before I got tossed out of the ring. I asked Steve if uh, are we, you know, if he if he wants me to do it, and he goes, he goes, yeah. And then he's throwing me the ropes. He goes, maybe we better not. And uh, <laughs> I, remember, like, I remember hearing it and going, I've already, I had already got it out and it had it in my hand. And, I, and when I landed on the floor, I got it out. And I remember Steve goes yeah. to throw me into the railing, and I I'm reversing Steve. And if you watch, I'm going into Steve's ear. I'm yelling out to him. It's like it's too late. I yelled at too late. <laughs> and I, I remember I walked over and I remember, you know, I'm looking right at all the fans and Steve's looking at the fans. It's right in front of everybody, including Vince is like one feet, like one foot yeah. away. And, uh, you know, we did it. And I, and it, if you look at it, it is absolutely perfectly done. There's hardly any, uh, not a big, big open gash. And it's not just a, it was just a perfect, I, I got yeah, it. Was a, yeah, it was a so master class of, of color. <laughs> yeah. The other beautiful part of that match is like ball shots. You know, ball shots mm. are almost a cartoon thing now like, mm. and have been for a long time. They do the ball shot, the, the punch up the, the arm up the crotch kind of thing when the guys stand over you and stuff. It was always kind of lame. And, uh, but I knew if, with this match with Steve, when I'm punching the shit out of him in the corner, and then he, when he kicked me in the in the crotch, you know, there's nobody laughing in that crowd. It's a, it's like a shoot. It's like absolutely, totally real. And it's um, and the and the and the work behind that. I mean, nothing nothing hurt. It was he kicked me perfectly, and it's just beautiful. Ex, you know, e, you know, expert uh, wrestling skills. You know, st- two guys that uh, really really work well together. And uh, like I'm watching on my screen here in my house, and I'm just watching where I'm where I've just cut Steve and it's like, you, there's no way anybody, this fans all watching and nobody saw anything. It's, I, I remember it's as I, real we, as it can ever get. We were yeah, watching, I remember it. watching Yeah, We watched it together. And, yeah. Yeah. And watching that reversal, even just the reversal, if you guys, anybody in the industry that's listening to this again, watch that reversal and watch the way it's done. And the way Steve goes into that barricade, it looked like you ate that thing. And Mark Eaton's running, Howard Finkel's running. And then, Brett, you just shield yourself a little bit from Vince and that quick. 
but there is no way at that. I did not. I, I was like, oh, that was hard way. I remember watching it, thinking, okay, that that was yeah. hard way. There's there's no way. And yeah, and also also I think that that the the distance that the Steve went when the reversal happened. It was almost like whether you consciously or subconsciously did it, but for me, when I took it out, especially when I just watched it back recently, it was one of those ones where, oh, the wheel went out on him again. You know, he's he's in trouble, the reversal, you know, he can't put the weight on the leg, and boom, like, it, it to me, it just, all that stuff ties in psychology-wise, and that's when things start to really, that's when the story, I mean, that's what makes a match, you know? You know, going uh, back to the, uh, going back to that now, when we were in the ring, it's the gut shots. And uh, mm-hmm. Brett starts teeing off. He's really working my midsections, about five punches. And then he goes to hit the ropes, and I sidestep him, send him between the second and third. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the spot. He goes down. Brett carried the blade in his mouth, spits it out. He picks it up. As, I, as I'm picking Brett up, because we had the crowd hook, line, and sinker from the get-go, from that double leg. Mm-hmm. And if you remember the double leg at the beginning of the match, I give him a look. I'm looking off to my right because, you know, I'm not going to look directly at him. I'm, I'm just looking off in the space, and then I make the attack. So I'm looking him off, and, boy, we're at it. So then we go to, to this spot, you know, the drum shots, and then I sidestep him out. He goes down. As I'm picking him up, what I said was, because we had him hook, line, and sinker, was judgment call, meaning if you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, we got him. Sure enough. You know, he comes, and the, <laughs> the way he goes in that, dude, this is like, this is a Surgeon General. Yeah. And the, again, <laughs> the only reason I wasn't going to do it myself, because I didn't have the seniority in the company, and I didn't want to get mm. my ass handed to me by Vince. So I was mm. under Brett's insurance policy. And so Brett did it. And he did it so quickly. When you watch, watch the way he walks up to me, he actually hits me in the right tricep with it, get a little gas there. The, the, you, you never see him do the cut on the forehead. And then he gives me a couple of rabbit punches and gives me a big right hand. And when he gives me that big right hand, I do a big swing with my head. And I splatter blood all over Jerry Lawler's notes. Jerry Lawler, years years ago, showed me, he had him in his briefcase, his notes from that very WrestleMania. And wow. there was just my blood splatter across uh, his, his notes. It was incredible. But you couldn't see it. It looked like a shoot. It looked like a, it was a hard way on the guardrail. And, man, I, 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 to, to this day, and it was only, that cut was probably only about a quarter of an inch long, if that, mm-hmm. and it was not deep. And I hadn't taken any aspirin. For some reason, I, you know, 95% of the time, anytime I've gotten color being bald, it really works for me and is, and is a great visual and I don't know how Brett hit the spot that he hit, but it wasn't a gasher. It wasn't anything that needs stitches. It wasn't anything severe. It was just absolute perfection. Yeah, the, another part of that match that was um, was 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 a big was a big moment that uh, almost almost backfired for a little bit. Was uh, like we talked about the the bell setting it on the apron, and, and I, I appreciate Steve's uh, kind words about that earlier, but. We had the the bell on a certain side and left there intentionally. So Steve needed to throw me out at the end of the match. He needed to throw me out on the bell side. Steve, you know, we got we did we didn't really think about it, and all of a sudden Steve threw me out on the wrong side of the ring. And as he threw me out, he realized like, oh fuck, you know, it's the wrong the wrong <laughs> the wrong side. And now he he jumps out of the ring like kind of like hoping I'll fix it. Like, and I'm going, I got to fix this. You know, I got to somehow get to the other side. And Steve going out to get the, the, uh, the cord, I guess is what it was. And I had, if you watch it, you know, it's in a second or two, I got up and fell back in the ring and took a bump inside the mm-hmm. floor on the floor. And then like, I was dazed and confused. I staggered and fell out on the other side where the, uh, mm-hmm. the bell is, but then Steve would have come in the ring and I would have been on the wrong side where there's no bell and I wouldn't be able to reach the bell. And he would have, you know, so it was just a little small thing, but it was a case of, you know, I think you can see when Steve walks down to get the cord, like it's like, oh, he's got to hoping that I'll somehow fix it and be on the right spot. And it, and I'm right where I need to be on the end. And uh, it's works perfect. No one even suspects. It just looks like I'm trying to get the hell out of there and kind of escape. Well, yeah. And, and to yeah. me, it just looked like Steve, this, you know, as this frenzied kind of like, those those bursts of of stone cold that was one of those and it's it's just like 
it, it's frenetic at that point and, and look out, who knows what's going to happen kind of thing. I, I, but I want to backtrack real quick to, to the usage of color in this. And, uh, you know, I get why they don't do it now. I understand with all the risks and the ramifications and, and possibilities and everything like that. But can you think of another match where the use of color means so much and and in the truest sense where red means green like imagine this match without that color well i i think it it's the whole thing i remember even when it was over i remember nobody nobody everybody thought it was the hard way like and we just went along with that for i mean it was never really much of a question and i think vince asked me about it and i said no it was hard way and that was the last ever, and I, you know, it's just funny how um, it came across. It was the perfect uh, bit of realism to just to, you know, it was the the visual of it all. I think, you know, I can't say that I, I saw it uh, other than I knew that this is where the one, you know, I was not a big juice guy. You know, I was never a big juice guy. There's certain situations, and this was one of them, where you really need some juice to make it work to make it really and at this time which i love in this time period in the business people still thought wrestling was real you know like a lot of people did and the, and the work that we you know perform in this match still lends where people that people that especially i find people from foreign countries that don't really watch a lot of wrestling or know think this is as real as as anything they've ever seen you know and it's it's so when you go back to that time period and, and, and how people kind of didn't know like the internet today or they didn't know who was turning heel before mm-hmm. the wrestlers did. And, yeah. you know, this was still, there was a, a bit of a veil on the business still. And I know from talking to countless uh, old timers, including my dad, all, after this match, this was their favorite match. You know, I've had so many people like Dory Funk and people talk to me about this match was the, mm-hmm. you know, just their, their favorite match to what, what they all did years before of, of realistic kind of credible wrestling matches of, of the highest caliber from Harley race to, you know, all the guys that came before that were, were hardworking wrestlers that, that sold the realism of it. And I think, you know, I, I really, when I look at this time, this time period, I go, you know, it, it was really changing, you know, the, the fans were changing and there was a confusing time. I know going into Chicago, I had a lot of kids that were my fans. I still was over with small boys and young kids. And uh, I started to lose the male team. Like they were starting to, to you know, I still had the old timers, mm-hmm. but uh, they were starting to go for something different. The the bulk of the, the, the youth in, uh, in wrestling the audience were like teenagers or males, I think under 30. And, uh, they were starting to go for the, the bad guys. And Steve was such a, you know, unique character. That even then, that's when I really loved the Steve. I know Steve's career took off in all kinds of ways after after I left WWE. But, I mean, I, I loved this time period. I mean, I, he was such a great villain uh, and such a good uh, promo uh, that was fresh and different. And, uh, you know, I've always been really uh, proud of uh, Steve and his career and, I was this match. I know that, uh, like Steve said, it it maybe had a lot to do with his success. Steve would have got where he needed to go no matter what, because he was just too good a worker and too good a talent. But, but I think this, uh, was the, uh, you know, I just knew what Steve needed and I, I knew how to work with a guy that, and we both, you know, there's never a struggle in this match. There's never a question of me wondering what Steve's doing. You know, whatever Steve does, whether it's a, the neck breaker or the stunner right out of nowhere, it's like, it's always like makes sense. And if, uh, you know, I cut him off with a kick in the knee or a thumb in the eye. And we, you know, we just always had, I think right from the, the, the day one, we had a good chemistry. I, I don't remember ever having a bad match with Steve ever anywhere. And, you know, every time we worked, it was always a, 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 a big smile when we saw each other in the back. And I was like, that was, that was great stuff. Like we loved working with each other. It was, you know, I, I loved every minute of working with Steve. You know, Brett, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because well, yeah, you said it before and, and what you were just talking about, you were feeling a little bit of a change of you know, the guard, and you could you could tell you were losing parts of the audience, but you still had different parts of the audience from, from a babyface standpoint. 
And so me, you know, obviously I was very in tune with who was cheering for me and who wasn't as well, or who was booing me. <laughs> That's what I was really concerned with. And cause I was trying to be a heel and this was a transition match, but I've always as deaf as I am and as hard of hearing as I am, when I get into an arena, I can hear a mouse fart. <laughs> and man, I am really in tune with that crowd. I am hearing and feeling everything that they're, that they're giving me, and I know I know who I'm getting. I know who I'm not getting. And you know, when this match was over, I'm laying in a pool of blood. I passed out from the sharpshooter. It was one of the greatest feelings I've ever had in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, there was still work to be done on my end, getting to where Vince ultimately wanted me to go. There was work to be done on Brett's end. You know, they, Shamrock helped that along, and Brett's subsequent promos would help that along. But I just remember laying there, and I, I didn't really, you know, I always knew. I knew it was a great match. I knew that probably no one was going to follow it, and we just blew the roof off that place. So I was feeling good about what we had done in the small picture. The big picture was yet to happen. So my question to you, Brett, as I'm watching myself sell the sharpshooter and limp up uh, the aisle, and there's that Austin chant starts. And I let them in for about three seconds. I don't, I don't acknowledge them. I, I look at them to acknowledge them. I don't shake my head and nod for them. I let them in just a fraction of a second there. And, and, and a lot of people will, will watch this and not even realize what I'm doing. I'm not trying to just all of a sudden switch baby, but I'm recognizing the fact that they started chanting Austin. So I knew we'd rock the joint. Brett, when you left... You know, people were cheering you. The one guy flipped you off, and you flipped him off mm-hmm. back. What were you feeling after going through a hellacious match? It was a physical struggle. We had a blast. We told a great story. But what were your feelings knowing where you were going as you walked back you know, to the dressing room area? You know, I, I, I knew that uh, I was going to turn heel the next night in a very subtle but strong way with like the way I did that promo the next night. I knew kind of knew where I was going. I was a bit worried about, you know, I didn't, I wasn't sure how the U S bashing thing was going to go. And I, I was kind of trusting Vince on a lot of that, but I, um, I knew, you know, I'll be honest. It's like psychology is something you learn in, in life. And I think if I learned the psychology, I knew the psychology of the match. From, from a school fight. I remember that there was a fight much like this. It was a, I watched it. I wasn't in it. But it was a sort of a baby face against a, a badass kind of a tougher guy or like guy that was more, got into more trouble and stuff like that. It was a kind of a badass in school and he was new. And I just remember the fight and I remember it was a really good fight. It was toe to toe and both guys you know, we're laying a lot of shots. It was an intense fight. I remember finally uh, the babyface won with a really big punch or knockout punch at the end of the fight, and the other guy gave up. And uh, I remember watching it, and I just remember somehow, even though the bad kid was started it and picked the fight, and was the, uh, he was expected to win, and the babyface won and just beat him fair and square. I remember it changed at school. Like the next day, the guy that lost, everybody loved him. Everybody had more. He had more sympathy, and the, you know, he became a somebody that he never changed anything. But anyway, the whole thing was played out like like I remembered it in school. And I remember Steve's character at that time, and I kind of knew that I knew with the blood and the way the way that match came off. I, it's like I knew that I had helped make like Steve was over for everything he had done on his own, but I knew that that match and the, our sort of working together and piecing that masterpiece together was in fact a masterpiece. And that was going to, you know, be a, a, a game changer for him. And, it, and I think it was, I it just sped up a lot for Steve. Uh, I think everything that was going to come to him anyway, but I also think Steve learned a lot working with me. I mean, we'd worked at survivor series and which was really good. We had some really great chemistry in that match. And I recommend anybody that wants to watch a good match to watch that one too, because it was just as good or in a lot of ways compare comparable. Mm-hmm. But when we got to WrestleMania, we, we, I think we had worked enough that we didn't want to do what we had done before. So we got to change it up and do something different. And, you know, that's, that's it. Like is the brawling kind of badass, tight, tough fight that we had. 
I I loved it for that psychology and and I I I think going back I I, I knew Steve was going to be a you know and I remember Steve talking to me about it he didn't want to turn babyface too quick he wanted it to be a really slow evolution where you know he was maybe thinking of turning heel a year later and I was thinking well good luck trying you know so you're going to be turning babyface a lot faster than I think a year but. But I wanted to, you know, whatever Steve wanted to do, I wanted to help him achieve that. And if he wanted to take his time before he turned into a baby face, then I, I was, I would try to help that. And, uh, you know, I think that, that the psychology of that match is, was just the perfect uh, formula to, for Steve to, to launch himself even more into that character, that badass character. And not to mention, I think the, the genius of um, the screw job and Vince playing the bad promoter and all that coming up down the road was, just classic um, stuff and new and ahead of its time. Nothing would have been done like that in the business before. And Steve's got to walk right into all that. It was perfect timing. And uh, I've always been really glad about that. Well, yeah. you, you know, in, in this match, I think, you know, Steve, you, you wanted it to, to come, you know, maybe later, but there were, there was two points in this where it was undeniable to me that, you know, uh, you were definitely going to turn babyface, and and maybe sowed the seeds of becoming, you know, the biggest babyface in the history of the industry. And it was after the the nut shot, which, by the mm-hmm. way, again back to your point, Brett, was it meant something, and it looked like a hoof from the basement, like like your nuts would be in your cheeks kind of thing after that. But then it was the chest buckle. It was the sell off of that, but it was Steve's sell too. That fired up, chucked to the corner, the stomp, the double birds, blood everywhere. It's like, okay, that. And, and to me, Steve, when you were in the sharpshooter and you brought that one hand up and you dug it in, like you're in a damn trench digging into the dirt, getting ready to come up for that first push up, I was like, Oh man, Oh, that, that was it that right there is to me the two moments where as a fan it's undeniable i would i I would agree i would agree with that point too and uh, i was thinking thinking the same thing and also if my memory serves me correct when you hit the double bird was that the only time that you did it in the match because the roof blew off like you were stomping him down in the corner and you threw those double birds and the roof about came off the place just you did it to shamrock real quickly too at one point well i did it to shamrock because uh you know brett is working the hell out of and so, you know, he was asking me, do you give up or did I want to quit? So I just give him the double bird. So that one almost didn't count. But, you know, and they covered it on com- commentary, you know, that I was answering, you know, his question with mm-hmm. sign language. Mm-hmm. And then going going back to Brett, you know, uh, I entered this thing, you know, I got I got a good response going out. But it was more heel. I guess I got some positive. I got, I got a lot of cheers, but I had I was more of a heel. Brett was way more of a baby, somewhat of a heel. Just from, just from entrances, and then uh, God dang, uh, there was two moments. The one, the one when I fired up on him with the chair, I caught him with the chair on the turnbuckle, mm-hmm. hit him with the flat chair on the back, picked him up with just like basically a scoop slam, sent him into the turnbuckle. You know, that's when we switched it back around. But but then going back into the stomps in the corner, mm-hmm. I remember stomping people in corners before, but never had I done something like this, and it was mm-hmm. totally on the fly, totally organic. I just started off because. When I talk about, you know, great baby faces, I always tell baby faces, you know, and I, and I talk, talk about it almost every show because not everybody still gets it. As long as I've been saying this, if you're going to be a great heel, you have to have a main streak. You have to be legitimate, but you have to be a main, you have to have a main streak. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it's time to get that heat as a baby face, you have to have fire. Now, all I knew was I needed God because, you know, whether you're a heel or baby, there, there's that explosion when it's like that guy's beating the shit out of you for yep. a while and it's time to make that comeback. And so it was a display of fire and people jumped, just, just brought, just, they just came like fire for that. And it was just stomp, stomp, stomp. And just Brett, the way Brett sold it went down. And then I was just started going into the rapid fire. You know, people do that to this day. I've em- emulated that spot. And then there was a double bird, and that last one was a stiff one right to the forehead. And it was totally working. To- you know, but I-, I know I didn't kill him. But, man, dude, that was totally spur of the moment. And that's how I really felt. And that's what that character did do. 
and you know, it just it just ended up being the perfect thing. And especially with the direction with which I was going to go, whether I remained heel or babyface, you have to get animated. You have to mm-hmm. give a shit. Yep. Uh, you have to be emotionally involved. If this guy's been, we've been battling back and forth, and the stakes, everything's on the line. I ain't going to tell this guy I quit, and he's not going to tell me he quits. And it's a friggin' fight. And so that fire up was paramount, you know, you know, uh, to that match and to where I would go because as you listen to the commentary, it's all skewed to, like Lawler says, well, if Brett loses, what's he going to complain about next? Mm-hmm. He's a whiner. And then they covered my ass. Stone Cold never said he quit, so commentary is all in line. Mm-hmm. But that, that little spot in the corner was just on the fly, ad lib, magic. Yeah. I knew it needed to happen. Brett did too. Mm-hmm. We, I didn't. I didn't say, "Hey, I'm going I'm to stomp you ten times." I don't know how many times I stomped him. That was totally off the cuff, and it worked. Yeah, and I want to back up too to what Adam was saying too, and just to point this out that nobody took a buckle like Bret Hart took a buckle. I'll just say that <laughs> nobody. Yeah. It looked like a finish. Yeah. You know, the, I think the Bret Hart prided done. himself in taking those. I, I I did always pride myself on the on the, the front turnbuckles and the back ones. I I um I think I'm paying for all that now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I you know in this match you know I think I, there's a lot of funny things that, that I that is little things that that are really exceptional like you know the brawl. I remember the, one of the few things that we kind of had going out to the ring like that we got permission to do or were told that was okay for us to do was to fight up through the crowd and um you know I, nobody had done that or that i remember yeah. unless it was by accident at a wrestling show that where it was planned like you know you got permission to go fight all the way through the crowd up the stands everywhere you want for as long as you want to make this match because well, i think that was the result of the us complaining about the submission aspect of the match and how dead it was going to be just you know i don't i'm not it wasn't i wasn't a big fan of that idea and as steve already said but you know, the the punches, I remember fighting and throwing punches on Steve. And even if you watch like today's wrestling and you watch punches, the punches in this match are so close. I mean, the fans are right there. So it's like mm-hmm. they're, they're right inches away from me throwing a punch. And I know that. I know that's Shamrock kind of pushing guys out of the way and stuff. But And there's, there's no security or anything. But it's just, when you watch it, I mean, I love the fact that I can throw these punches on Steve and he's selling them and they're right in front of everybody and they're going... Wow, that's as real as it gets, right up close. And it's not like on camera, it's like everything looks so real, right? To like the backdrop and the fighting through the crowd. And, you know, I, I love this match for, for, for how, you know, like, like you were saying, we just switch back and forth all the time. Like Steve didn't end to call anything. And I, I'm aware of Steve's, um, you know, what he's trying to do and how his character is. And I, I don't, there's no, Absolutely no rush or panic anywhere in this match. It's two guys that are so totally relaxed mm-hmm. and trustful of each other. Like we don't, there's no hesitations or scrambling or even from the bell being on the wrong side. There's no panic. It's mm-hmm. just super calm. Right back to the to the you know fixing what we need to do to keep telling this beautiful story. And uh, I love that about this match that we always had this this chemistry and. Uh, it's probably, you know, when I think back, it's probably like back then there was Vader and guys like that in the, the final four. I think the reason me and Steve kept working with each other is we didn't want to keep tying up with Vader. You know, we just kept going <laughs> back to each other as much as possible. Steve with the flu and all that, you know, and even the rumble. I, You know, the rumble is a big part of the, the heat of this match. When he cheated me out of the rumble, I was still a baby face. And I'm really mad going into this match. He screwed me out of the title with uh, Sid and hit me over with a chair on the apron and cost me the belt for my fourth title win and all that. So it was, it was great. I remember going out like, I should want to kill this guy. I'm This guy screwed me over at every turn and is a son of a bitch. And I'm going to, I'm out to get him. Like I'm, I'm, this is a, a huge heat match. Steve's a super heel. I uh, he a, had so much heat going into this thing. And Steve was a, a total heel. Like, if you watch that rumble and you see the look on Steve's face when he sees me come out, he's totally the chicken yeah. shit uh, heel that uh, panics right away when he hears my music and all that. And, you know, to, to switch all that to this 
this dog fight that we have and, yeah. and Steve being getting that sympathy mm. and everyone going at the end of it, you know what? They love Steve Austin better than the guy that won it. And even though I was, I was a good guy. I didn't even, I wrestled Steve. I always loved that about my matches. I wrestled just the same way I would have wrestled him as a baby face, just a little bit different facial expressions yeah. and just little things. But it was, I think two guys that, sort of had an idea of what we would and wouldn't do to, to make each other's characters. And I think I always trusted Steve in the ring and uh, Steve always trusted me. And we always had a sort of a, an understanding what we were trying to do together. And I, I always thought it was just magic, you know, all the time. Yeah. No, another one of the little things that I really, I, especially at the end when you talked about, you know, you rolled out to the other side to, to get to the right side where the bell was. And then Steve comes in, wraps the, the cord around you and you at a desperation, swing the bell back and hits him. Just even the way that he was just laying there in a heap, it just looked, it just, the, the it just the visual of it. And then trying to pull himself up and get back in the fight. And you grabbed his foot and just the way you subtly pulled him was like, it was like an animal, like jumping on a, a wounded gazelle, like a lion jumping on a wounded gazelle and pouncing on, on him and to, to take advantage of that, that, that injury. And then you put him in the sharpshooter and then you start to go from there. And, and like those visuals from there with the, with, with Steve fighting, like to me, that is just maybe the greatest visual I think in the history of, of a WrestleMania. You know, there was a couple of things and talking, to, and, talk, and talking to Brett and listening to him. You know, I was just watching this match back, and you're you're 100% correct. I had never knew that I'd thrown you out on the wrong corner, and I saw you covering because I remember I'd go out to get the extension cord, and I just saw you. I did throw you out of the wrong side, and I never knew that. And here's uh, two other facts. When we were brawling up, this is one of my famous things that if you watch some of my, my matches closely, you'll see me do this. Like there, there was a guy, this is back when I used to walk around with the Cokes and sell you Cokes while you're still in your chair. And there's that guy there. He wasn't a plant. That was a real guy selling sodas. <laughs> so I, I, well, see, you know, I, I didn't blow up at all, neither did Brett, because we we're both in impeccable shape. But I could use a swig of Coke or a swig of water. So I stole one of the Cokes from him. I drank it. My character would do that. Plus, I was a little bit thirsty. And then I, I throw the Coke on Brett. I, I go back to grab that tray from that guy because I was going to wrap it around Brett's head, but he wouldn't give it to me and it was strapped to, <laughs> to the back of his head. So I said, well, fuck it. I can't take it. I can't wrestle it from this guy. And so me and Brett do action. And then another thing that happens in the match, early on we go outside the ring, and I'm going to suplex Brett and crotch him on that guardrail. So yeah. I do that, but the security guard is in the way. So Brett hits his leg and kind of splits him over a little bit. And we, we wanted to maximize that bump a little bit better, but the guy got in the way. And as I take off, I go to clothesline Brett. And as I'm clotheslining Brett, he's straddling the guardrail. If you watch his back in the beginning of the match, as Brett is going ass over tea kettle over the guardrail into the audience side, I can feel his arm underneath my stomach and it starts torquing. I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna, I better get off his arm because it's going to break because something's got to give here. Mm. So if you watch me clothesline, it's Brett's right arm. I can feel it underneath me, and I come up off of him. You'll, you'll, you'll never see me do it, but I was cognizant of the fact that his arm's about to break if wow. I don't get off of it between the fulcrum and, and that, that guardrail. So, yeah, I never realized that I'd thrown you out of the wrong side, Brett, but you are correct. <laughs> you know, at the time, I remember – you actually, if you look closely, you see you kind of cussing as you're walking down to get the apron, uh, to get the, the cord. Because you, you telegraphed to me, because you knew in the ring, you said something along the lines of, I fucked up or I'm on the wrong side. And and it was like sort of like, okay, so I know. And I, I, I realized that we were on the wrong side too. But you were aware of it walking down, and you basically knew, like, okay, I'm going to go down and get the cord now, and somehow you got to get on the other side, and, uh, and that's exactly what I did. It was because you tipped me off that I needed to get over to the other side. So, I mean, you you were still, uh, you know, on top of, uh, you know, you were totally on 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 target still. You know, it wasn't like we had it covered. As soon as I, as soon as it was again, there's two guys just totally working with each other all the way through, and. Uh, it was just, you know, I, when I watch it back and I, I see it, I, I know that um, this is one of the first pay per views I had in in a year or so that um, that didn't hurt. Like I remember um, even a Survivor Series when I wrestled Steve, 
I was in a lot of pain. I had been off for about a year, and I wrestled Steve after I worked with Sean, and I had supposedly gone home to rest and all this stuff. And I, I took it took time off. And when I was coming back, to that's when they worked for Steve. But I was really sore after the match with Steve. We worked really hard. I hadn't worked in like I worked a couple of times in, in the summer, and I worked sparingly anyway. Just to, and I was off for six months. And so by when I started wrestling after the Survivor Series. I was in a lot of pain every night. I'd crawl back to my room every night, and it took me about, I swear, till about the Royal Rumble to get where I didn't hurt anymore. Like, I got broke broke myself back in. But I remember being in a lot of pain. Everything hurt, and uh, I was really sore and almost getting where I was wondering if I could could, could get back to my old form and stuff because I was just aching everywhere. And I started to kind of get back to form after the Rumble, and by the time I got to WrestleMania, it's like it was just a really good time in my career where I was back on track. I had my timing back after that that layoff, and and if anything, it, it proved itself in the sense that we had a better match than that Survivor Series match. And I, I don't know how Steve felt about that Survivor Series match, but I thought it was as good as we could have done. I thought it was a great match. I loved the match, and I thought the intensity and all that was so good. I thought that'll be the best match we ever had. And then, of course, this one at WrestleMania was was just a climax even more above and beyond that. It was just such a good, um, like I said, I always compare it to us to, to a good school fight. And uh, there was, had all the psychology of a really good school fight between two really tough characters that were getting ready to, to, to deliver a match that had a lot of emotion in it. Shouldn't be understated, too, how important a ref is to a match like this as well. Yeah. And, Tell us a little bit about the about the importance and how well Shamrock played his role in this. Because I mean, he was. I think the, the job of a good referee is to to be out of sight until it's time not to be out of sight, right? And like, he was just he played the role to a T, and especially all the way to the end. Like, how important was his role to the overall um, scope of this? I thought it was extremely important to the match, just because this 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 match was built. It was a hot angle. Uh, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret the Hitman Hart, and it was a submission match. Anything could happen. I love Shamrock, uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, I was watching his entrance, watching his entrance to the ring, and then I watched my entrance to the ring. You know, and a uh, little bit of interaction between uh, me and him. And then my notes here: are Shamrock goes to the ring. He looks great. He has tremendous star power. There was a danger factor to Ken Shamrock, and if yeah. anything got out of hand, he could fix it because he was the most dangerous man in the world for a shoot. He had he had charisma, and he was a perfect rec- ref for this match. And he didn't try to steal the attention away from myself or Brett. He mm-hmm. played it very down the middle, very vanilla. And I thought I thought Ken Shamrock was paramount to the match, and I thought his his performance was phenomenal, and his interaction with Brett super important for yeah. Ken's Ken's character, but also to further Brett's Brett's character. So I thought Shamrock was phenomenal. Yeah, also you know, didn't I have to worry that, much when he was going into when he went into the crowd when he was there either, huh? No, he helped. No, <laughs> he he didn't. We didn't tell him anything about the color. Never mention it to him. Never, and you nope. can tell when the when he sees the blood in the match, it gives him that realism that that he needs to play off of, and it's yeah. like, wow, he he's kind of, for lack of a better word, marking out a little bit. Like, holy shit! It's like, no, he didn't see that coming. Uh, you know, I don't think he was like, uh, you know, he'd seen worse things, I'm sure, in his lifetime. But I just think it kind of blew him away. Like, wow, this is like I didn't see that coming, and and. That was another thing I loved about it is the, his reactions and how he plays, how he gets more intense after the blood, even like on the floor outside the ring right after it happens and stuff. It's like he builds right into the, the whole story of the intensity and the realism of it. And I think it was the right thing to do not to tell him because it made it more of an element of surprise that you can't capture if you tell him. Yeah. Well, and, uh, it's also it's a testament to the match itself, but to Ken, the fact that you forget the referee is Ken Shamrock, you know, because he he stays out of the way like a ref is supposed to do until it's his time at the end of the match after it's over and really help set you up on that that heel turn. And, uh, you know, he's there at the right spots, uh, I guess, and um, and not there and kind of ghost 
ghost-like on the other the other spots, which is, you know, a, a good roughing job. Because how does a guy with arms like that, you know, at, at that point somehow take take a, a you know, just disappear from the match almost, except when it's needed. So that, that yeah, you know, but here's good... here's the thing, guys. You, you know, I've special refereed several high profile matches. Being a referee is extremely hard. I have so yeah. much respect for them, especially the good ones. It's all of a sudden, yep. you take a guy who's worked for ten years, as in the case of myself, and when I was doing the referee thing, thirteen years, whatever. You know, we, we kind of know the rules, but we don't know how to ref. It'd be like a, a, asking a referee to work a real match. Mm-hmm. There, so it's two different things. And so Shamrock did a great job of staying out of the way, but he was always visible, never trying to take the attention. Like mm-hmm. I said, he's jacked up. He looks like a million bucks in the charisma factor and star power. He was great. And, and I thought one thing that really added to the match, uh, as he added to all the matches, one of my, one of my biggest uh, thrills when I first came to the WWF well, I'm such a Howard Finkel fan, yeah. and when I when I was walking to the ring, and I and I'm hearing you know from Victoria, Texas, you know weighing 252 pounds, Stone Cold Steve Austin, just the fact I mean you know Howard's still there, and I love all the other you know announcers that they brought in since then, but when Howard Finkel was announcing you to me, that was the shit, yep. and it just felt like a big match, and then on top of that, because I was you know noting you know my entrance in Brett's. When you work with Brett, and most of the times I work with Brett, we were building up, even though the, uh, what was that, the SummerSlam match, whatever it was, you know, or Survivor Series, whatever that match was, that was a great match, and it was a great atmosphere, and was that in the Garden, I believe. Mm-hmm. Great crowd. The, the ring was mic'd different, had a different feel to it, but I love that match. But this, because of where Brett's at in his career, where I'm at in my career, I've already made my entrance after Shamrock. You know, uh, Brett's coming out in the baby face position or in the champion or in the veteran position. And man, when that guitar riff hits and those, those streamers or those sparks, whatever, go off on top, the electricity and the, the way that power chord that Jim Johnston wrote just rips through the crowd. And I'm over there and I'm, I'm ready to go. I ain't nervous at all. I'm ready to rock and roll. <laughs> It just shoots a, a, a chill down your spine and through your body. And if you don't understand it, you're dead or you don't really have a take on the business or mm-hmm. when you're working with someone that's super over like Brett was. Yeah. And then here he comes with that intensity and that focus. Dude, it's a total shoot. And it's a feeling, it's one of the best feelings in the world. Like I said, laying there in the pool of blood was so great because it was all over and we did the job at hand. But one of the funnest things is when you're working with guys of Brett's caliber, their interest will, will send chills down your spine and give you goosebumps. And I knew at that point, although you know we could shit the bed, we probably weren't. But I knew when Brett was coming to the ring, I knew it was on in every sense of the word. And it just it meant so much to me to, to hear the response that he got because we're playing off each other. My pop is dependent on him. You know, his, his pop is partly dependent on me and, and the body of work in which he's putting in. But it just it just means the world to you because the way that crowd reacts, you can always rope them, and, and, and if you don't have them by the beginning just on entrances, you can get them with, with the match. But we had that crowd from the get-go, from the entrances, and it was a thrill just to, just to be in the ring when that guy hits the ring. Well, you know, speaking of, of crowd reactions, and I know I mentioned this when you slammed that hand down and got ready to you know dig in and, and, and come up in that push-up, you can hear that crowd. That, that crowd becomes like a, a tsunami you know, at that point when you're coming up there. And and that is such a huge aspect of that's when it's changing. And they get that profile shot of the blood just coming off your nose and like, you know, kind of Rocky Balboaing out in the air kind of thing. And I, I, that to me, it's just, it, it's such a, a game changer. And then that iconic shot uh, that is then on the back of a t-shirt, blood from a stone. I wore the thing for a year straight. It, it that shot is what maybe all of two seconds, but it it changes the course of, of everything. Uh, so you talk about the the crowd reactions. That I mean that one that was pivotal. But I want to bring up a really cool point that I forgot about until I watched it today is the fact that you actually broke it and Brett, you you held on. You didn't let go, but you fell and. And that was so huge. 
it, it, it's such a like a, a subtle subtle point but it was so cool it's the fact like oh he broke it mm, but man that pit bull he still locked on that to me was such a such an important moment to add to the realism and and we're talking subtleties that was a huge subtlety to me i actually remember in the ring uh making a when we talked about it I remember saying to Steve that I compared it to that uh, scene in Cuckoo's Nest where uh, Jack Nicholson uh, um, shows that uh, thing sink through the tries to throw the sink through the window or whatever to get out of the, yeah. the, the prison. Or it was the same thing. I said, you know, where you almost like when he gets out of that sharpshooter. If you want my honest that is where Steve. That's that's where that's where Steve. That's where they fall in love with Steve. Like he's a baby face. Yep. Yeah. Because they don't. Nobody kick. Nobody gets out of the sharpshooter. And so I, I, for Steve to kick out and actually start, that was where he, when he starts to bridge and the blood and he's pushing. That's that's the moment. Mm-hmm. That's yep. that's right there. Is, says it all. Like that that moment is is done. Like it's it's forever. And it doesn't matter what happens after that point. Steve is a baby face from that second because it, it breaks the heart to see him lose. Like when he doesn't and I pull back and I get my balance back and I put him in the sharpshooter, it's just too much for the fans. It's like it's too much of a it, – that the, that's the beauty of psychology. That's, that's the example of the psychology of that match. But that's where everything turns. That's where Steve – they fall in love with him as a, as a hero. What he the, just did was is heroic. And the thing about that was, you know, we knew that I was going to pass out in the sharpshooter. The the color was the bonus feature that mm-hmm. nobody else knew about, and you know, only two people knew about that, and that was myself and Brett. Uh, but when I was in that sharpshooter, you know, Brett Brett and I didn't say, "Okay, man, maybe maybe thirty seconds in you'll tap, or a minute in you'll tap." Well, we didn't we didn't discuss any of that. That was a total work uh, of listening to that crowd, feeling the crowd. You know, I started I started going out before I did that iconic dig into the mat you're talking about, Edge. You know, and do that. You know that, oh, dude, dude. When you when you look back at it, that's the stuff that heroes are made out of. You know, I'm it's yeah. grinding it out, it's digging in. Oh boy, here comes the big push. But that was a trust factor between myself and Brett. And, I, and you know, I didn't want to disrespect his sharpshooter because mm-hmm. it was such you know, a devastating finish when he applied it to anybody to last, you know, between a minute and a half and two minutes with that thing with blood pouring out of my head was just an amazing image, but it's not something we talked about. And yeah, I almost kicked out of it. And so that was a trust factor. And that was two guys out there feeling the crowd, working the crowd. And, you know, it wasn't like Brett was giving me the office when to pass out, you know, that was just him doing his part me doing my part and that's two pros on the same page at the same time. Here's two things that as I look at this match and watch it back, uh, when we're in the corner, Brett's given me some vicious right hands and I, I'd done a, a, a sell job into the corner, facing the corner, hanging with both hands. Brett spins me around yep. and starts giving me those big right hands. And I give him that big nut shot and you can hear Jim Ross go, that was down from around Saskatoon. <laughs> and so, you know, Brett's just selling a dead sell, which is a shoot. And then you know, I, I'm out and I start, you know, trying to climb up using the ropes. And it yeah. was so effective because, you know, he's just beating the shit out of me in that corner. What I wish I would have done now, or, or this is what could have happened, if I could go back in time, I would have milked. Just sitting, you know, on my ass in that corner, Brett taking a nut shot. You know, we played it for what it was. I got up and we started taking care of business and it worked. But what if I had waited 30 more seconds before moving because Brett wasn't going anywhere? Mm -hmm. And then what if I'd have waited a minute? And I'm not sitting here, you know, with a stopwatch just clocking it. I'm just looking at the match and saying, God damn, if I'd have stayed down for a little bit longer, how much further could we have drawn them in? And, you know, that was one thing that I, that, that I wonder about. And then I also wonder if I'd actually broken the sharpshooter, reversed it, and put it on Brett. Then he ultimately reversed it and put it back on me. Then I passed out. That, that's a what if. I think it played out perfect on that front. 
But, Brett, do you see what I'm saying on that ball shot? Because we could have milked that for five minutes if we needed to. Yeah, it's, you know, I always get mad when I see ball shots that are just wasted. You know, that they're just stupid and they don't even look good. But sometimes they're good. That's one where it's like, that's why you don't want to make them a joke or make them just do them all the time. But when you need an ace under the table, this is a great, it's such a cheap shot. And at the same time, with the blood and everything, and me just wailing on him mercilessly in the corner, it's like, come on, you know. Like, there is a bit of, like, someone just kick this guy right in the nuts. You know, it's like, and it's, and when it happens, it's like, somehow, this most heel thing that anybody could do to the baby face, that I was still the baby face. It's just brilliant uh, psychology. And uh, we I don't know where that spot came from, but I remember thinking... You know, because you always, I always worry about ball shots in the sense that they can be, you know, they sometimes they, they don't react right. You know, they, and I remember thinking when I watch it back and I see how I fell back and how I grabbed, it's just the way, <laughs> it's the way it would work in real. And, you know, it's just great psychology, great. It's not overselling that ball shot. I remember just the way I hit, the way I hit the mat and the way I stay still. You know, I could have sat there for a minute, and everyone in that building bought that ball shot to the T. And uh, it, it's 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 just such great, uh, simple, simple psychology. And wrestling should be as simple as this match is. Everything in this match is so simple. And I love all the little things, like Steve said, where like I'm going to get the bell, and then I change my mind. And I go get one chair, and I go, no, nah, this one's not it's got padding on it. I want the yeah, other. Yeah, I saw that. It's all and, and then you grab the just, second one, and there's a Coke spilt on it, which just added. It really did. It just. It's like, oh, they. He just grabbed whatever one was there, whether it had Coke on it, coffee on it, whatever it was. That just added to it. it, it all of that. I mean, it doesn't look like you said about some of the today's wrestling. Everything looks rehearsed. There's no rehearsing here, and there was no rehearsing. You know, we don't. We talk a bit about, about things that we're going to do and stuff, but I. You know, I think the the way I played that with the chair and the bell and all that and how I would, this chair's not good enough was all just spontaneous. But if you, like we did, went out to the ring going, if this was a shoot, I remember we talked about just the eye contact at the end when we were looking at each other. I said, we should try to do that stare down. And I said, you should just come right at me and take me off my feet like a shoot and just go at it right from there. Like two guys on the playground soccer field or whatever at school and there's a big fight and everyone's there and it's like all of a sudden it's like let's get it on and the guy just comes it was just great uh, psychology all the way through i mean i really you know i always think of this match uh, like i my iron man match with sean and even the wembley match with davy were really great for me realism kind of matches and uh this one is is great realism and it's all a work everything is just is the pace, even the pace we cut. I recommend for any wrestler out there that if you're going to cut a pace in a match, you want to cut a match, the pace, the same pace that we're cutting in this match. It's not too fast yeah. and it's not too slow. Yeah. Today's well, super intense. Just, nobody no. sells anything, you know, and yeah. we get so much mileage out of simple things, an elbow, uh, uh, a kick in the gut, you know, uh, you know, and then we we build into things like a nut shot, which don't happen every day. With the chair shot, the bell. You know, I love the bell shot at the end because I know that I totally miss Steve. If you watch that, I, I totally go over his head. I don't hit anything. I remember going, I hope it looks good because I didn't touch anything. I didn't even. Steve just Steve just reacted. I totally missed him on that. I think if anything, I hit him on the back with that bell, and it just looks great on TV and. Uh, you know, even the cord, Steve's wrapping that cord around my neck, which, you know, if you wrap somebody around the neck with a cord like that, you might just strangle them, you know, um, if it gets tangled up. But, I mean, Steve, it's so loose. But it's, at the same time, you look, at there's no danger to yeah. me at all. Like, I've never had my oxygen cut off. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it looks so real, like a shoot. And yeah. that's yeah. what I love about this match, is it has all the intensity of a UFC fight, except for... No, nobody got hurt in this. It was so perfectly done, even right to the juice. It was like you could put a dime in Steve's head, and yeah, it yes. was perfect. Well, speak, speaking of the of the level of this match, um, you know, 
Steve, you talked about before, you know, um, with getting the color in this match and not feeling at the time you had the clout to make that call and you were kind of relying on Brett to do that. And also that uh, the, the respect that you had and how much you wanted to work with Brett and how much it meant that he kind of handpicked you at one point to be an opponent for him. And Brett, you saying that you felt like Steve had learned some stuff, you know, from you out of this match and the other one um, at Survivor Series. And, you know, from coming out of this match, now you're on the you know, the, tra- trajectory, the the trajectory of your career changes, Steve. You know it just skyrockets. What were the tools that you took away from Brett or from this match? And I've always felt like you can't really you don't really know what it takes to be a top guy unless you're in there working with top guys and seeing the work that you have to put in and what it takes. What was it that you took away from Brett or this match that helped you on that rise? Well, just the rub and the fact that we were able to you know there were two stars in that in that yeah. in that match and two bigger stars coming out of it. And Brett was already established. We we're just going to go down different roads. But just my takeaway, just from working with Brett, uh, you know, just like with many, you know, veterans that I got a chance to, you know, when I was three, six months in the business, working with guys like Danny Davis, gorgeous mm-hmm. Gary Young, guys that didn't get great breaks that were very, very good workers and, and had sound psychology. You know, one of the biggest things I got from Brett, you know, his composure, uh, the, the thought process that he put into matches, you know, Brett's level of psychology was probably, you know, I'd, I'd say it was a little lot deeper than mine because we were two different characters, and I think he was a different level of worker and, you know, one of the, one of the great masters. So just the thought process, uh, and I think we were both on the same page just from a reality standpoint, and, and our characters totally meshed. And it was like from, from the very first match we had to our tours in South Africa uh, to Germany, uh, all over the United States, you know, Survivor Series, and then, uh, you know, WrestleMania 13. Just, I don't know, for, for some reason, I, I took away a lot of things, but just this thought process and just the trust. I mean, anytime, no matter where we were, there's just, just that trust and that, that, uh, this, the sense of, you know, nothing's going to go wrong because I trust him. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're going to the ring. You guys know you've been on the road for 20 yeah, Composure years. is a good word. When you said composure, I get that. That's a good word. Yeah, man. And so you just always know that, you know, nothing's going to go wrong and, and, and everything's going to go fine. And just, uh, I loved, you know, I know Brett has talked in the past about not being real fond of some of his promos, but his promos and his feud with me, his promos leading up you know, to this match with me, him when he shoved Brett, uh, when he shoved uh, Vince McMahon on his ass and he said, frustrated in the goddamn word for it. Everybody in that dressing room knows I'm the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. And I'm thinking, I didn't know that promo was going to go down. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, man, this is a fucking shoot. Yeah. And you know, Brett's, <laughs> Brett's lost his mind. So, I, you know, I, what I love about Brett was the reality of his character, the psychology of his matches. The, the, the mechanics, uh, you know, the techniques in the ring, everything, the presentation. When you watch Brett, you know you're watching a pro. Anybody can call themselves a pro wrestler, mm. but it's a pro presentation that is truly, to, to me, the highest art form from a presentation and psychological standpoint. And that was that, that's what makes a great performer and a performer that draws money. That's what I took away from Brett. Well, I, I'm going to say this. I know you, we've kept you guys already an hour and a half. I know you got better things to do than, than chirp with us. But I, I want to say that, you know, perfection is subjective, right? But it, in my eyes, watching this match back, it's it's the perfect way to to have a fight within a wrestling match. Uh, two characters shifting at the same time, which on paper sounds like it will never work. Uh, yet at at the end of this, everyone comes out of it a bigger star. It absolutely changed the direction of the business. From that point forward, everything is different. And I can't think of another match that crystallizes that that point any more than this. So I guess in closing, I just want to say it was really amazing to go back to be able to watch this and then also to sit down and pick your guys' brains on this because this is kind of unheard of. So we we really appreciate both of you taking the time to do this because this is the kind of thing that 
I, I think it gives people and uh, you know fans and it, it gives people within the industry to be able to sit down and hear this. This is like a master class mm-hmm. on how this should be done. Whether it's getting color, whether it's the subtleties of a neck breaker, whether it's it, it, all of those things. I mean, man, this is just really, really cool. And uh, kudos to both of you guys. Um, there's a reason Jay and I both, uh, you know, are, are fans of you guys and, and uh, glad we can both call you friends, too. Hey, man, on, on, on a closing note, I know you guys are going to wrap this thing up, but I want to get this in. Just like Brett said, after this match, I wasn't sore at all. I've been sore after a lot of matches, depending on, you know, what we did. I wasn't sore at all. All I can remember is I bled so much of that match. And Vince is covered on the back end. He goes, this was an ugly match. You don't always see this here. You know, he's already apologizing to all the sponsors or whatever. And then they show a picture of that mat of all my blood. It's just like clumps of flesh and blood. It was, it was gross. It was wonderful because that was the violent story that we just told. So my point is, I wasn't sore at all. I was fresh as a daisy. But I remember it took me about a beer and a half and I was drunk off my ass because I, I probably had about two. I probably had about two pints of blood left. It was phenomenal. Cheap date. <laughs> Uh, well, again, guys, thanks. This was uh, this is very cool, um, and thanks for carving out the time, uh, you know, to do this with us because um, you know, I think a lot of people are going to take a lot away from this. Well, I say, you know, I don't do a lot of podcasts and stuff for anybody anymore. I try not to. I end up, I think, I hurt too many feelings, and <laughs> I, I <learned> that. <laughs> sometimes the truth can be a little bit. You know, when you when you call it the way you see it, kind of thing. And I, I, I so I, I don't, I don't regret anything I said or anything. But I know that uh, podcasts can be a little bit trouble for me. And the fact that we were going to do this today is, I could talk about this match as you probably can tell all day long. I talk about it a lot to people, you know, that that don't watch wrestling much or have never watched me. I say, watch my match with Steve Austin, WrestleMania 13. And it's one of my proudest matches, and I'm so glad that uh, we got a chance to talk about it. I'm glad it's a, it's an honor for me to be on the phone with Steve and just to reminisce and remember it. And uh, and it was a, it was a, just a, a great period in my life. And uh, I know, you know, at that time period, I think I was really in my prime. You know, I was in the best best wrestling prime of my life. I was just super form, and it shows in that match with. You know, being a veteran or whatever. I mean, I just, I think it was the peak, even walking back to the dressing room after the match. And when I'm walking back to just before, I think right after I give that kid the finger, you know, I always think that's how I want to be remembered is that last 20 feet where I'm walking, the look on my face and the, just the realism of that match. It was just it's such a great period. I knew when I came back to the dressing room and I remember I got met by Undertaker and every other wrestler in the dressing room that has said, you know, good luck topping that. Like they they were just in awe. Everybody was like, I think they, I think we got clapped for. Uh, and we came back. I can't remember, but I remember just being so proud of the match, and everybody was just blown away when we came back. And uh, it, to just talk to, to all you guys on this show and have a chance to reminisce about it is an honor for me. And just you guys, uh, the questions you asked and everything was. It was a lot of fun, and I appreciate uh, you giving me the time to, to rehash and relive some of the memories. Well, uh, again, man, thanks, yeah. guys. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. I, I know you got stuff to do, but that was uh, that was really, really fun. It was amazing. That was awesome. Yeah. So much, thanks so much for your guys' time. And they said it's a it's a timeless match. I think that'll be shown in in any era, and we'll uh, we'll always stand the test of time. So obviously, something to be proud of for for both you guys, and should be a a match for aspiring wrestlers to to be studying um, for years to come. I would think. But thanks again so much for your time, guys. Really, really appreciate it. All right, guys. On a closing note, I I booked a three hour time slot. So if y'all want to talk for another hour and a half, I'm good with that. <laughs> Let's do the don't, don't look, look at me. me. Yeah. <laughs> for how long? <laughs> Hour and a half. <laughs> hey, man. Thank, thank you guys for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's always good talking to Brett. Everybody, I, I just hate, I don't want to blow too much smoke up Brett's ass, but he knows I love him and I loved working with him. And it was very, very, it was extremely important in my career. And I appreciate everything you did with me. And I have so many great memories of our times in the, 
in the ring and over in Africa and Germany when I go out of my way to try to pop him or make him break character and laugh and arrange some of the ribs that we played on each other. That's a podcast for another day, but nothing but respect for Brett the Hitman Hart. He truly is one of the greatest of all time, and uh, this podcast reeks of awesomeness, so thank you for having me on. (laughs) Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks, Brett. I truly don't think it gets any better than that. No. I mean, my mind is melted from sitting in on that conversation. I mean, think about it too, right? Like, I mean, t- th- like we, you and I watched that match together. I don't know how many mm-hmm. times, so like I said, when we were up and coming and we were studying that match and like slow motion, putting it like in, in uh, you know, frame by frame and watching it in slow motion, different things, why they did certain things, backing it up, watching it again and again and again. And then, you know, to become, you know, get in to WWE and travel with Steve and, and, you know, get to pick his brain when he was like on fo- you know the the top guy, and then you know to come to know Brett, uh, and become friends with him, and be able to sit down and have dinners with him, and hang out, and become friends with both these guys. And now for them to come on this podcast, after all of that, and sit here and just listen to them talk about this match, it just is it's surreal almost, you know. Yeah, and you know just to as peers be able to sit down, and pretty much have all of the same points. Uh-huh. I think all four of us, after watching it back, all riffed on the same things. Yeah, and I know, like, as we were talking, too, and, like, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of times you were you were asking a question. I was like, damn, I wanted to ask that. <laughs> yeah. like, so, but it's, yeah. it, it, it's funny because, you know, we do think a lot alike as, as far as, as certain things go. So that's not surprising. But, man. But, again, they were the... bringing up points that I was, like, oh, yeah. I, I, oh, I wanted to talk about that. Yeah. They already brought it up. You know, yeah, it no, just... it was good, though, right? Because we were just, yeah. same thing. We are just kind of sitting there flying the wall, like, getting to listen to these two guys. But the thing that stood out to me the most is the respect that these guys still have for each other yeah. and had for each other, you know, and what what each guy meant to the other one. So, yeah. um, and Steve, you know, basically, you know, like I said, arguably the, the, the biggest star in the history of the business saying that without Brett, he wouldn't have got to where he was at. That's pretty huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as we've talked about, Steve was going to get there, but that match, man, that uh, that, that changed the the direction quickly you know if if there's a graph it spikes after that and you know t-shirts are created from it uh yeah. you know, and like we talked about you know i'm not a big fan of of color in the business especially now and, and where we're at and the knowledge we have and all of those things but man that is an instance of it meaning so so much yeah. and changing what that match how it's how it's viewed you know it would still yeah. be a classic it also shows you the genius of brett to make yeah. that call right like yeah. to to knowing what that you know risking what you know that it, they could both get in serious trouble over it but to him it, and for and he's also trying to help steve get to another level as well right and that's both guys working together and that and just shows you the psychology that no this isn't going to work unless this happens or it could work but it's not going to get the same effect and he well, already and saw essentially that, you know yeah p- pitching something that's going to in the end help Steve more than it's you know yeah. going to help him if you're looking mm-hmm. at it the, in that in that way it's going to help them both but right. that that's a pretty selfless call to go okay I'll I'll put my butt on the line too and and do this because it needs it in order for this to be good for your character steve it needs it and how how good brett did it i mean yeah. you watch it back and yeah okay mm-hmm. but pff, i'm if you didn't know and it hasn't been talked about then it was done so seamlessly and so well um that you really even after years in the business have to sit there and go hmm okay uh oh okay it just there's so many aspects of it It, it's a master class on on character on on uh, less is more on getting mileage out of things that may seem little but are not little because when nuances that that you know little things add up little things add up and i'm i'm a super stickler for for little things and like they were doing things and this even watching it back now that were blowing my mind you know and And, uh like you talked about the reversal on the outside when steve kind of stumbled yeah it just looked so 
out of control and mm-hmm. real and not pretty yep. and the whole match was was not pretty and i mean that in an absolutely in the best way possible it just yeah. looked like two guys that were trying to be the best yep. and it really also we didn't even wanted to fight yeah you know, like and Brett we didn't said, even... Brett's like two guys like in a schoolyard that just were going at it and everyone standing around watching these two just slug it out you know that's the great analogy of it and we didn't even talk about the fact that I think that was the first time he used the figure four in the ring post. Yeah, I know. I was thinking that too, but it was you know kind of too far in. But it, it, I'm not sure if it was or not. But um, that was that was pretty uh, you know pretty integral part of the match too when he was working on his legs. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just re- <laughs> and Captain Lou and Tony Atlas in the front row. I completely forgot yeah. about. And I love when they go into the crowd. Captain Lou goes straight into oversell like. Old, yeah. like, 70s carny mode. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I also I want awesome. to call bullshit on something Steve said because he said he only has a few few moves. I, I think Vince must have known when he thought of the this, this submission match that Steve had one submission because he did the leg sweep, like, octopus move with the, with the, with the yeah, leg yeah, over I the did. head. He hey, pulled wait, that out he, in there. He also yeah. did Boston Crab. Yeah. There yeah. is a couple of them, and so. he went for a sharpshooter. <laughs> yeah, so did. he knows a few. Yeah. But, uh, He's sneaky. And, we we talked about that though how yeah. well the commentary and how on point that commentary was a three man booth and all three of them were hitting different points and covering yeah. all of the points Vince saying that you know Steve could beat Brett into submission was a huge point yeah. to mm-hmm. to make the match you know on an it also heel. it suited his character more than a guy that's going to go out there and yes he did throw in a Boston crab and but those are you know and the other one the whatever it is the octopus one that he did but Staying true to his character, he more realistically would beat the shit out of a guy enough where he's like, okay, I've had enough. And yeah, that and, and JR, you know, saying, you know, you're not going to make Austin submit, you know, and, yeah. and kind of foreshadowing um, yeah. eventually where it went, but you wouldn't think that, you yeah. know, uh, if you're watching. It was just all, uh, so well done on so many levels. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and again, special thanks yeah. to those guys for taking the time um, to uh, to let us. You know, I'll sit under uh, and, and, and listen to this conversation with two guys that have uh, a most respect for each other and, um, you know, put on a clinic that night in WrestleMania 13. So, again, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Brett. Really meant a lot that you guys did that for us. So, well, And it's you talked about, you know, how you can tell the respect that they still have each other. One of the things that is built through a match like that or is something that stands the test of time like that is uh, this – almost brotherhood or sisterhood or that uh, you've shared something that um, that has stood the test of time. And I would think it's, you know, a music producer and a band or it's pick the analogy, pick the comparison. And I I think we we have the same thing with the Dudleys and the Hardys. And, uh, you know, you have it with Randy and I have it with, you know, John or Taker. It's just one of those things that when you are able to create something that people, you know, still talk about, then there, there's that instant brotherhood and you just pick up where you left off. And it was really cool to, to hear that with those two, you know, arguably and unarguably actually the the two, you know, two of the biggest ever to, to lace up a pair of boots. And, um, yeah, it was just, like you said, fun to be a fly on the wall for that. And, um, you know, from at that point, really kind of just starting to think about getting to WWE and when that match happened and fast forward all these years later and, to, like you said, be able to sit down and just talk to them about it as peers was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> again, you know, we uh, thank those guys and uh, thank all you uh, hoser, so uh, for 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 sticking around and listening to us for a year. So yeah, uh, this was a, this was a good way to uh, to kind of cap the year off, the year that was in the ENC pot of awesomeness, brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but seriously, <laughs> it, it has been. I think uh, throughout the year, people have started to uh, to hop on board and realize what this what this thing is all about, and that yeah. uh, we're just two goofs having fun. And yeah. if that's your your bag, then you're gonna enjoy this. So thanks yeah. for listening. And we're just we're just um, two guys trying to get these fucking marks to buy our t-shirts at ProWrestling.com. 
Bossingtees.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you want want to end yeah. the the, no, the one kidding. year anniversary. Matt's gonna edit that out. I was just joking. I was trying to pop you guys. He's not gonna edit it out. Um, yeah. yeah. So anyway, thanks. It uh, it's been a slice, and um, I hope you enjoyed this one because th- this one was pretty damn special in our uh, playbooks. So yeah. we'll see where we go from here. Yeah, brother, brother. All right, hosers. Without further ado, we kept have long to enough. go. Yeah, this is a long one. This is a long one, but it was <laughs> worth it. It was worth it, I think, folks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was worth it, hosers. Ooh. All right. All right.